Ambassador Dennis Ross has been shaping U.S. policy in the Middle East since the Reagan administration. He's now with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. We're pleased to have him here this morning. Welcome. Thank you. So what can the United States do? What are the risks to do something? And what has to happen before they can do something? I think, first of all, we have to ask the question, what happens if we stay on the path that we're on? And the problem with staying on the path we're on is that you're going to have a sectarian war that becomes deeper and deeper. You're going to have a sectarian divide that basically becomes unbridgeable. When people say there'll be a civil war, we're already in a civil war. When people say you're going to see increasing violence, we're, we've already seen the increasing violence. The danger of the current track is that basically you're going to end up with a failed state. You're going to lose central authority. So we have to find a way to accelerate the departure of Assad. And I don't think there's one single action that will work. I think you're going to have to pursue a series of different actions. The Russians are a kind of pivot. You have to try to work to move the Russians. I think the Arabs need to be in a position where they say to the Russians, you can be a friend with Bashar, you can be a friend with us, but you can't be a friend of both. I think we have to also try to deal with what is the core of Assad's support. The, he is a leader of a minority sect that governs and has governed Syria for a long time, the Alawites. He says to them, basically, your survival depends on my survival. The message has to be no. Your survival depends upon his departure. I think we also have to begin to think about what is it you do to change the reality on the ground in a way that Assad himself begins to see that the balance of power is changing. And what can you do to change the reality on the ground other than some kind of support for the rebels or armed intervention? I think a safe haven in the north is something that we have to think about very seriously. We did it in northern Iraq for the Kurds for a long period of time. It wasn't a mission that expanded. It was something that, in fact, we were able to control. The cost was something that was manageable. I think we have to begin to think about it. I think we have to begin to plan. You can't bluff on this. This is something, if you begin to talk about doing it, you'll actually have to do it. But I think it really would change the, the realities and also the psychological balance of power as well. If, in fact, um, Putin would say to Assad, it's time to go, yes. would Assad go? You know, I think there's a high probability of that. This guy's not Gaddafi. He's not a hero. He's not going to lead an underground. If he thinks the balance of power psychologically and practically is changing, I think he goes. Now, one of the reasons I say that is he's basically said to his own following, look, I got an insurance policy, and it's called the Russians. And if it turns out he doesn't have an insurance policy, then I think the realities begin to change. So when you're looking at what's happening today, you've laid out what can be done. Yeah. Who, though, if you, if you went to that safe haven in the north, who should enforce that? Who controls that? Obviously, it borders Turkey. And Turkey says it will not do it unless the Security Council uh, provides support for it. If you don't move the Russians, you're not going to get that. If you can't wait to move the Russians, then I think you have to look at NATO playing this role. Could I go to the Israeli-Palestinian issue once? Sure. There's a story in the New York Times today about Ehud Barak, the defense minister, saying that perhaps Egypt has to set the boundaries uh, because the peace process is not working. Is, does that have legs? Is that a viable idea? Do you mean Israel, in a sense, setting the boundaries? Yes. Yes. It's I the think, story in the New York Times, yeah, lead story today, by the defense minister of Israel, the former prime minister. Sure. Look, what it reflects is the notion that if you can't negotiate something, you're still going to have to create a different reality. And it means Israel being prepared to take unilateral steps. Now, we've seen unilateral steps taken before, and they didn't work. But I think what drives Ehud Barak is the notion that for Israel to remain Jewish and democratic, it cannot stay in the West Bank. Uh, and I think we had a very important statement by the Prime Minister of Israel. I don't know that he's going to embrace the idea of unilateralism. But he said, uh, as a speech the day before yesterday, that Israel cannot become a binational state. Now, as soon as he said that, he was taking account of the demographic trend, which over time, it's not immediate, but over time, are such that basically if Israel stays in the West Bank, it can't be both Jewish and democratic. One of the factors that led Yitzhak Rabin to Oslo was the idea that Jewish would, Israel would remain Jewish and democratic. One of the reasons that Ariel Sharon withdrew from Gaza was to ensure that Israel would remain Jewish and democratic. So the fact that Ehud Barak is raising this and the fact that the Prime Minister of Israel talks about not becoming a binational state suggests that something has to change and if it can't be done through a mutual process, it'll be done unilaterally. It's better to make it mutual because then it's agreed and it's enduring. Yeah. It, that is, in fact, the growing consensus. That is, in fact, the real threat to Israel. I got to go, but that's, yes. the, that's yes. the point you're making. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dennis Ross, good to see you. you Thank too. you so Thank much. You.